Bhagavate Vasudevaya Those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires surrender unto demigods and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their natures. Purport. Those who are freed from all determination surrender unto the Supreme Lord and engage in his devotional service. As long as the material contamination is not completely washed off, there are by nature not devotees. But even those who have material desires and resort to the Supreme Lord are not so much attracted by external nature. Because of approaching the right goal, they soon become free from all material lust. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is recommended that whether one is a pure devotee and is free from all material desires, or is full of material desires, <clears throat> or desires liberation from material contamination, he should in all cases surrender to Vasudeva and worship him as stated in the Bhagavatam, Matu 310. Less intelligent people who have lost their spiritual sense take shelter of demigods for the immediate fulfillment of material desires. Generally, such people do not go to the Supreme Personality of Godhead because they have the lower modes of nature, ignorance, and passion, and therefore worship various demigods. Following the rules and regulations of worship, they are satisfied. The worshippers of demigods are motivated by small desires and do not know how to reach the Supreme Goal. But the devotee of the Supreme Lord is not misguided, because in Vedic literature there are recommendations for worshipping different gods for purposes. For example, the diseased man is recommended to worship the sun. Those who are not devotees of the Lord think that for certain purposes, demigods are better than the Supreme Lord. But the pure devotee knows that the Supreme Lord Krishna is the master of all. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi 5, 142, it is said, Ekali Shwara Krishna, or Son of Nature. Only the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, is the master, and all others are servants. Every pure devotee never goes to demigods for satisfaction of his material needs. He depends on the Supreme Lord, and the pure devotee is satisfied with whatever he gives. Hare Krishna. So the verse is kind of um, touching a sensitive topic. Um, it touches the topic of worshipping the demigods. Hare Krishna. Yeah, what to do. The demigods um, are respectable agents of the Supreme Lord. They are not by no means like human beings. They are by far superior to human beings. Um, still, they're also not on the level of the Supreme Lord. Uh, because it is said 
Abrahma Bhuvana Loka Punaravatina Arjuna Mamu Peche Tukundeha Punar Janmana Vijate. It is said that from the highest planet within the material universe to the lowest, all are places of misery because of repeated birth and death. You see, no matter what we gain, we may gain so many things, but uh, then, I guess I'll play at the end. <laughs> Do it the other way around today. So, the idea is that some are worshipping higher beings for improving the material conditions of life. So we turn to the devatas to get material blessings. And it is Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita who is speaking out against it. And that is this verse. Uh, sometimes they think that uh, it was Prabhupada who spoke out against, or that maybe the Western devotees, they do not have the full appreciation for the devatas. But actually we're seeing that here Krishna says in the Gita uh, that those who worship the, the devatas, their intelligence is stolen by illusion because they worship for temporary results. Because all the devatas can give us is temporary benefit. Give us gain, give us health, give us wealth, give us fame. Uh, still, we're not speaking out against uh, the demigods. That's another mistake. We're speaking out in favor of respecting the demigods, but worship we, res we reserve for Krishna. That is the point. Aradhanam sarvesam Vishnu aradhanam param. Of all worshipable entities, Vishnu is the most worshipable. Patma Purana. So Padma Purana is not just any scripture. Uh, it is like one of the principal Puranas. So Padma Purana carries a lot of authority. Uh, the Vedic literature are very complex. And one Vedic literature may something, say something, and other Vedic literature may say something else. There are 18 Puranas. And out of the 18 Puranas, there are six Puranas that are known as the Sattvic Puranas. Or they are for people in the mode of goodness. Six Puranas are Rajarsic Puranas, they're for people in the mode of passion. And six Puranas are Tamasic Puranas for people in the mode of ignorance. It is said that the Puranas in the mode of goodness, they carry the most authority. So Patpa Purana, Vishnu Purana, Bhagavad Purana, they are carrying more authority. Oh, so. so yes, uh, the aim of life is to be happy. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the living being is by nature pleasure seeking. Ananda mai byasat. We're always looking for something that, to give us pleasure. But the point is, is that where will we find it? Uh, not in temporary things. Uh, not that we are, are looking for temporary misery either. Uh, it's not that in the cause of saying, we don't want temporary pleasures, we only want misery. No, it's not like that. Uh, although Kunti Devi prayed, Vipada Santuta Saswat Tata Tata Jakatkuru. When we were in danger in the forest, Kunti Devi said, driven out from our palace, palace, bent to the forest, staying there in a dangerous situation. That was the best time, she said in her prayer to the Lord. She said, because at that time, we remembered you the most. See, when we're comfortable in the palace, then who's praying? But when we are in danger, oh, then we're praying like anything. Mm. So we must turn towards Krishna always, not only in times of danger, but in all times. Oh. So the eternal goal of life is more important than the temporary one. Oh. Still, we would prefer happy conditions of life. Oh. Today the sun shines, I prefer it to yesterday. <laughs> I must say, it was, it's much nicer today than yesterday, uh, absolutely. But anyway, uh, 
we when it comes to the temporary things if it can be nice good but if it's not nice uh, well we tolerate it what can you do it is tolerated uh, uh, it's temporary it's temporary you can see uh, I arrived just uh, uh, just really yesterday early early morning uh, like I reached here, reached the temple by 3, 3 a.m. Uh, from a long journey. And it was horrific weather. And I just landed into miserable Melbourne. <laughs> and I was just thinking, why did I come here? <laughs> what a mistake. I thought I should have gone to the Sunshine Coast instead. Why did I book a ticket to Melbourne? But today Melbourne looks much better. Just see. Uh, so that is material conditions. They always change. Always. Therefore, when we have a hard time, don't take it too serious. Because it won't last. It will get better. It will get better. Okay, hard time for a while. Everybody has a hard time sometimes. But some people get all mental by it and all depressed by it. And they start thinking, you know, it's like, Oh God, life is so bad. See, they turned it into whole life. It's not life, it's just some time. Okay, some time is not good, but then they have a bit of a bad time, then it says life is, is bad. So they've magnified it and extended it to whole life. Whereas life is both good and bad. Huh? Sunny days and, well, whatever we had yesterday. I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> it was too much. Uh, yeah, so uh, ups and downs, they just come and go. Uh, that is the nature of, uh, of the material side of life. And no one can change it. All the money in the world cannot change it. Uh, it cannot change it. It cannot change happiness and distress. Even if you become super rich, still there will be happiness and distress. Just another taste. Of course, if you become super poor, uh, that is not very nice. Uh, that is also not normal. Um, I was just in South Africa, and there are uh, these, these big... Uh, differences you know like there's these townships made of sheds tin sheds right where like millions of people are living actually like near cape town where i was near the airport two million people live in these tin sheds shanty town type of setting and then over the hill there's another two million people and they live in nice uh, in nice houses huh? and i know someone who came from this kind of ghetto background and who wrote a book and he wrote and we we have have a dry crust of bread and over the hill they have cake <laughs> he's writing like that they have cake and yes uh, which reminds me of Marie Antoinette uh, who was who was when the French Revolution was there they complained to her that the poor people had no bread to eat. And her answer was, let them have cake. <laughs> that was like something that was the last straw that caused the revolution. She lost her head for that one. Yeah. Uh, understandable. So I'm not speaking in favor of, um, of, of choosing material miserable circumstances. Uh -huh. We can do something to improve our conditions of life. Uh -huh. Something, yeah. But it depends on our needs. Right? If we have many, many needs, then we have to work very hard. If we have less needs, then you have to work, don't have to work so hard. So there is an advantage to having less needs. Uh, then you can live more simple and you have less headache and you don't have to work so hard and so on. But if you have a lot of needs, 
oh God, I need all these things. And then you marry someone who also has a lot of needs. And then together, you need a lot. And then you're going to get children, and they also need a lot. And then all together, you're going to need so much. And then you have to work for it like anything. Uh, so, I wouldn't recommend that. I would re recommend to keep the needs a little down, a little simple, if we can. Oh, but real, real needs are there, obviously. Real needs are there. Uh, it's like when it gets cold, okay, then I want warm blankets, and that's not luxury, that's survival, right? So, survival and, and basic comforts and needs, all right, fine. But then beyond it, all right, you know, some need a little more than others and that's okay. But how far do you want to take it? Mm. So, because the real goal of life is eternal. That's the real point. Huh? So, we're not speaking out against material arrangements, have them according to your needs. But if your needs are so many that you have no more time for the eternal, well, then we're missing out. Then we're missing out. So that's really the essence of the Gita. The essence of the Gita is to make the priority in life, our eternal relationship uh, with the eternal Supreme Lord. Here, we are eternal beings having temporary relationships. That's the thing. So many temporary relationships, and they come and go. Huh? Isn't it? Once we were living in the same place. For how long? A year, a year or so. I think so. Talk to each other every day. Then we haven't seen each other for years. Huh? Yeah? <laughs> yeah? But it goes like that, you know? Yeah. Time, time separates us and brings us together. Uh, and like that. It, it comes like that with so many people. Uh -huh. My parents, you know, they, at one moment uh, they were there and then they died, right? Both of them kind of soon after each other. And then all that was left was a picture. And it's sort of, oh, it felt strange. Yeah, it's like suddenly all that is left of people is a picture, just like that, from the one moment to the next. And it seemed so, so much real, the relationship, so real. My parents, so close to me, my well-wisher, my parents, and they are like my everything. In the next moment, all that is left is a picture. Now they have been pictures for 40 years. Well, since 40 years I've pictured parents, what to do? It is like, I'm over it emotionally now. Now it's not an issue like that. It was then, now it's okay. But now I see that, like what Srimad Bhagavatam says, like two, two little pieces of straw floating in the river together for a little while, and then the waves separate them. Two souls for some time together. And then the waves separate them. The waves of time separate them somewhere. But we continue to exist. Uh, and the only thing that brings, that keeps us together is when we have friendship based on eternal principles. Friendship based on Krishna consciousness is different than friendship in the material world. Friendship based on Krishna consciousness continues on the spiritual side. <laughs> when I see a coward boy with a beard, then I know. <laughs> and I know who it is, you know. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You never know. So, yeah, ultimately, relationships between devotees are of a different nature. Because we are all serving Krishna, and therefore these relationships are also bringing us together to Krishna 
and we get therefore genuine relationships based on spiritual advancement and what we share in service to Krishna that can continue after this life. So even for husband and wife, eternal love, it is possible after all. You thought it was never going to happen, but it can happen <laughs> if you <laughs> continue <laughs> into the spiritual world. <laughs> <laughs> some like it, some don't. <laughs> what can we say? <laughs> ah, well, leaving that aside. <laughs> leaving that aside. My point is, eternal relationships um, exist with Krishna. Because whatever we do there is meaningful. Otherwise, what do we do in the material world? Uh, blowing balloons looks impressive and then whoop, gone so many balloons huh? a big house and we have a big new house let's have a name on the house what shall we call it how about balloon eh? <laughs> balloon big balloon right uh, the new car the new car what number plate shall we put on it how about balloon? The new boat, what shall we call it? Let's call it balloon, right? You know? Hmm. Yeah, that's also balloon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so like this, we are getting, we're blowing all these, all these illusions we create in this world. And so much energy we put in there we make these big illusions, and how long do they last? So the idea is to engage in something that lasts, something that is durable. That is Krishna's point. And therefore Krishna says, the devatas, the demigods, they give us temporary benefits, temporary results. Why would we invest in that? What's the point? They are balloons. Huh? What is the point? building big kingdoms. Huh? When I was in school, I had to learn history. And I thought history was something really, really foolish, you know. And I had to learn all these dates, right? I had to learn different dates, like, you know, 1600, the Battle of Newport, you know. And I thought, like, why do I have to know this, right? What is the point? What do you have to know about Napoleon, right? He's gone. Where is Napoleon now? No more Napoleon. Huh? Bhagavatam says so many kings have come and claimed the earth and what remains of them is only names and even they will be forgotten with time. What's so important about being a big king, having a big kingdom? When it's, how many years can it last? Hmm? If you die a natural death, then maybe 80. But you might get killed before. <laughs> By a relative. <laughs> or your good wife who puts something in your dinner. <laughs> or your sons who would like to take over the throne, may arrange for a little accident. Are you sure you want to be king? Hmm. Like that. Um, so these are temporary things, king and queen in the material world. Mm. And that is the thing, that in Krishna consciousness, we have to come to the point where we, uh, where we use temporary things. Uh, we use, but we're not going to over-endeavor for it. So, whatever is within reach, yes, a car, all right, one that you can afford, have it, a house, okay, something you can get without too much work. And if you don't need a family, you don't need a house. Easy. Oh, I like that. Uh, so, I'm not speaking out against material things. 
This is not a let's go to the forest lecture. Huh? This is not let's all pack up and renounce everything. That's not what it's about. No, no, no. Have it all. Have. Stay at home on the sofa. It's okay. The problem comes... It, I'm not against sofas at all. I mean, I, in fact, I like sofas, to be honest. But if you need a new sofa every year, just to show off to the neighbors that you have a new sofa, I think then, you know, you've taken it uh, not so far, you've taken it too far. <laughs> I think you've taken it way too far. Right? Because the sofa is supposed to work for us. We're not supposed to work for the sofa. Right? I mean, the sofa is sort of supposed to cushion the back. I wouldn't mind if instead of this thing they would put a sofa. <laughs> it would be more comfortable, to tell you the truth. But whatever. So, I'm not against taking it so far, but too far when you work for a sofa. You know, just another one and another one and another one. Refurnish the house, get a new house. I mean, come on, you know. Relax. That's the point. Keep life relaxed. Uh, because it's about Krishna. That's the idea. It's really about something eternal. Say, so, yeah, okay, but... You, say, you may say, yeah, but I, I still want a girlfriend. Oh, no problem, have a girlfriend. Right? One, if possible. <laughs> If possible, one is good. And marry her then after some time. Right? And if you, if you want a second one, Krishna allows it. You can have two wives, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> I don't think. No, I'm saying that's, that's not peaceful, I would think. That would be complicated. Uh, one, one. One is enough. And then, yeah, one, one has to be satisfied. Um, one has to be satisfied. The mind, the mind is such a thing. Uh, the mind is such a thing. Um, what can be said? Uh, it is Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said that Ladies, they are looking for the perfect man. And of course he doesn't exist. <laughs> when, they, when they get a little older, they realize it. <laughs> and then they, get, they still hope, they hope against hope. But meanwhile they remind their husband all the time. From, oh, you're supposed to be a perfect man. You know? um, but that's what they're looking for. For a perfect man who doesn't exist, of course. Yeah. And, it's, and then Srila Bhakti Siddhanta says that men, um, men are not so faithful. Men, they are attracted to all women. They don't want to limit themselves to one. They want many. What can be said? Such is, such is life. But if you get too much involved in these kind of things, all these kind of relationships and so on, this one with that one, and then we break it and get another one, or have two at the same time, or have a hidden relationship and all this thing with the, the one from next door, and all these things. <laughs> so much distraction, so much distraction. Huh? I mean, not going anywhere, not going anywhere. Um, better just be satisfied, be married, have your children, uh, for better or worse, uh, and, uh, and move on in Krishna consciousness, ultimately. Uh, now it's always interesting when you see someone after you haven't seen him for a long time. <laughs> I'm sort of looking at you now with a white, all white hair. Uh, I must look old also. <laughs> I shaved it all off just yesterday. 
But time, time is moving very fast. And then, yeah, then you think, what do I have now? Huh? What have I achieved? You know, so many years I have worked. What do I have now? After so many years. Uh -huh. The only thing you have is what you've done for Krishna. That's all. Nothing else. Nothing else you have. Everything else is with you for a while. But the only thing we have is what we've done for Krishna. And with, when we are devotees, then after some time we begin to realize that. Uh -huh. And as time is running out, it is good. Because it, it makes us more serious, actually, to to become, and we can see that at the end, uh, many people become more serious in, in their spiritual life. I was just remembering a story, um, how one year I came to Mayapur, and I saw a man dressed like Salvador Dali. So in my mind I was going, hey look, there goes Salvador Dali. You know? And then I saw him in the temple in Mayapur, chanting and chanting and chanting. And I usually, when I'm in Mayapur, as a sannyasi, I try to do something special and I get up very early in Mayapur. So I was up very early. And then I saw that he was also up very early, our painter. And he was chanting. And then later in the day, I saw him in the temple chanting. And in the afternoon, he was still in the temple chanting. In the evening, I saw him chanting in the temple. And he was going to all the arities, everything, and saying, who is he? Who is this man? How can he do all these things? Where does he get the strength? Who can do something like that? Chant all day? Go to all the arities in the temple? Who can do that? So one day, I walked up to him and said, are you a demigod? <laughs> he said, maybe. <laughs> Huh? Maybe. I said, all right. But it still didn't explain everything. Then later I found out. He wrote a poem and I read it. And the poem said, I saw that old man and I saw his followers and I saw how much they worshipped him and I saw how much he changed them. I saw. It was 1967 in San Francisco. He was there, he saw Srila Prabhupada, but he decided to keep a safe distance. Don't get too close. Ooh, you get too close to this Swami, it's going to upset your whole life. So he decided to keep a safe distance. And from a safe distance he was looking at Prabhupada, but I tell you one thing, not safe enough. <laughs> he might have kept a distance, but he developed faith. Because he saw how all these devotees were giving their life to Prabhupada and how he changed their lives. And he developed faith. But he never got initiated because he never got close and he never got serious about it. But all that faith was in his heart all these years and now in his old age. He was getting serious about it. And actually, because of a whole life of, of so much faith in Prabhupada, now he had the strength to do something that an ordinary devotee cannot do. To chant the whole day from morning to night, to go to all the arities in the temple. Who can do it? Every day, you do it. Let's see. Huh? Not so easy. But for one who has faith, it is possible. It is possible. One who has faith, one who can see. One who can see uh, that, that Prabhupada was not an ordinary person. And that he changed people completely. Uh. Look. Uh, this temple started here in Australia by Australians uh, and Americans. Uh, American devotees came and started it here in Australia and it went on and developed. Uh, and here we are today. Uh, this movement is a movement based on 
on faith, faith in Prabhupada, right? That's how it works. Um, and and on, on that strength, we can do many things. Huh? If I didn't have faith in Prabhupada, I wouldn't be here today. No way. Uh, I, I would have other things to do. But because I have faith, and when I read this, and I think, yeah, these temporary things, they come and go. Huh? Yesterday was so cold, I was thinking, boy, oh boy, it's still winter in Australia. That's what I was thinking yesterday. My first day in Australia, I thought, it's still winter. And today, it's summertime, man. It was good in the park. So, just see. Um, if not for Prabhupada, I would have been uh, overwhelmed by material things. Um, but because here is someone who himself uh, showed so much dedication to Krishna that he made it real. Uh, he made it real by his actions. And he showed that he could see Krishna. He showed it by, by, just to, by his constant dedication. See, if you can't see Krishna, you can fake it for a while. Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. But how long can you do it? Uh, as soon as the door is closed, you put your feet on the table. <laughs> Let's turn on the TV. Right? Yeah, if it's not real, then you're going to watch TV. Then you're going to have to do something mundane. Uh, but if you see Krishna, then you're ready to chuck your TV out of the window. So what do you want a TV for when you have Krishna? Something dry and material. Uh, so Prabhupada showed all that, that he had no interest in any form of material enjoyment. Uh, this morning I did my puja and I thought, let me turn on a lecture of Prabhupada. And then he starts speaking about sex. And he says, sex is the one thing that, that motivates everyone in the material world. Uh, the, whole, uh, the whole material world moves because of sex life. Uh, he said, amongst the animals, the plants, human beings, then he carried on and he got strong in the lecture. And he said, sometimes they say that marriage is legalized prostitution. Look, okay, uh, intense. It was a little intense. Huh? But he could say such things without accusing, without being accusative, you know, without... Uh, he was really beyond it. He was just beyond it. And he showed that there is a life beyond it. <clears throat> a life beyond sex. Even, even marriage or all these things. A life beyond it. And he showed that. Yeah. So when he says it, it's different. And then it's not insulting or putting anybody down. Then it just shows that he is up. Uh, way beyond where we are. He is somewhere there, up on the spiritual platform, beyond the ordinary lusty desires of this world. His desires are only there for, for, for satisfying Krishna. Yeah, so that is, is the real thing. Huh? Let me see the real thing. Let me see an example of one who is really beyond this world. And then we say, okay, okay, now I believe in this. Uh, because now there is a living person who is doing it. It's not only a book, but there is a person who is actually living it and making it real by living this knowledge of the Gita. The Gita alone looks like a book of very high standards, but who can live it? But when there's a pure devotee coming with it, who is the embodiment of it all, then it, it comes to reality. It's no longer some ideas, it's become something that is being lived. And then if we see 
how this movement changes people, ordinary people, and turns ordinary people into special people. Huh? Then we see how, this, how it works, how it actually works for anyone and everyone. And that is what we are talking about. So material desires, we all have material desires. Huh? Desires for sex are very strong. Who can say he doesn't have such desires? Huh? But let us at least begin with not having faith, faith in it, see? There's one thing, when you have faith that sex will make me happy, that's big illusion, big time. It won't make you happy, it will not satisfy, it will drive you to do many things, and then you may get what you wanted, and then still not satisfied, and then you want more. And then you get that, still not satisfied. That's the nature of material life. Uh, so therefore, something has to go beyond. Children, oh, you want children, yes. And then you have children, and they're not exactly uh, ideal either. Uh, how many problem cases are there? Many. Right? And you love them, that's okay. But... Uh, Still, they also break their parents' hearts. Uh, so many cases, at least. So many stories you can write, movies you can see, books you can read about children that break their parents' hearts. It's not all just a wonderful bond so close. So to put all your hopes in that and say, oh, children, it's the all in all. Uh, a father, I will live in my son. Uh, all right, you know. Uh, no, we will continue to live in another body. <laughs> we'll not live in your son. You will live in another body. At the end of this life, you will just continue to live. You will not be dead. You will move on to another body. What have we done with this life? How have we used it? How have we used our time? Have we actually done anything, anything to, to, to think of our relationship with Krishna. But Krishna is so far away. I, he's so far away from my life. I can't relate to him. Chant, chant Hare Krishna. Chant Hare Krishna and Krishna will come closer. The more we chant Hare Krishna, the closer we will become to Krishna. If it rings again, I'm confiscating it and sell it in the marketplace. <laughs> I'm watching it now. Ah, yes, yes, yes. I will take your phone. Yes, yes. Or then I'll take it anyway. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so like this. Um, Krishna is so far away. But if we chant, he'll come closer. This is the trick. Uh, and we simply chant Krishna's name and Krishna will get closer and closer. And then that whole feeling that Krishna is so far away will disappear. And suddenly Krishna is very close, very close. And that's really how this movement works. Uh, first we feel far away from Krishna. It's some idea. But we chant and that brings us closer and closer, and then we can serve Krishna with inspiration. Mm. So, I'm just talking about uh, us, right? Uh, who, have tr who are trying to be devotees, and yet we are all reaching some limit, you see? We're all coming in this movement, and then we reach some limit. We're not going, taking it any further. It just there's a limit. So we have to take it beyond that limit. That's the personal battle that we have. Everyone has that personal challenge to go beyond your limit. 
You're going to meet your limit at one point. First you come into this movement, it's all new, you discover it, and you. I started chanting four, twelve, sixteen rounds. Yes, every day now. How many rounds are chanting? Sixteen. How many rounds are chanting? Twenty. I'm chanting like anything. How many principles are you following? Twelve. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 So, like this, we make so much measurable progress, so much measurable progress at first, and then we're there, it's fixed in the principles, chanting the rounds. Are you reading the Bhagavad Gita? Yes, I read the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Okay, are you, are you coming to the programs? Yes, I'm coming to the programs. Are you reading Prabhupada's books? Yes, I'm reading them. Are you, are you offering what you eat? Yes, I offer what I eat. And now what? Are you happy? Uh, no. <laughs> yes. That's the next problem. We reached our limitations, our point of limitation. Huh? We've settled into the process and we made so much advancement and then we reach the, the walls of our own consciousness, the limits. We can't, can't go any further. Uh, now it begins. Now it really begins. It's like dancing, you know. It's not enough to go to the shop and buy the dancing outfit and you put it on and you stand there. No, no, no. Now you have the outfit. Now you have 16 rounds, now you have four regulated principles, now you have the outfit, now you have to dance. See, that comes next. So yeah, but that you have to learn. It is dancing we have to learn, but we have to dance for Krishna. Dance. Oh, dance, oh, dance, oh, dance. That means we have to give ourselves generously, generously. Uh, dancing is something that you do it, and afterwards you feel that you've done it, you know? You think, oh, why did I do that? <laughs> Jumped for one hour, and the next day, oh, your knee <laughs> is playing up. And you think, why did I do that? Yeah. Um, so dancing is like that, where we get spontaneous, go beyond our limits beyond our limits. We must go beyond our limits in the service of Krishna. Give ourselves to Krishna. Do something extraordinary for Krishna. You want something extraordinary from Krishna? Then we must do something extraordinary. Mm. So, this is the way that we can be devotees. Um, by giving everything to Krishna. So that is Bhagavad Gita. Krishna is not speaking out against worship of the demigods. He's just saying that it is secondary. It is more important to just worship Krishna because that is, gives eternal benefit. Demigods give temporary benefit. Just investing in material desires. And whether you worship demigods or whether you work 20 hours a day to make top dollar, it's the same thing. Uh, materialistic. So let's not be materialistic. Let's just be Krishna conscious and do something extraordinary for Krishna. Ten minutes left for questions. So anyone has a question? Yes. Um, in book of Gita it says demons get liberated when they are treated by Krishna. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we also aim to reach liberation. Yeah. So we should be killed by Krishna. No. <laughs> okay. I know uh, that it's not ideal. Okay. However, what's the difference? Like we reach Krishna Loga, so that's okay. Uh, and they also reach. So what's the difference? Puttana. Oh. It said she was a Rakshasi. She was stealing children and. Uh, the residents of Vrindavan said that generally these witches, they eat the children. They steal the children, they used to steal the children and eat them. That's what they said about Putana. Such a witch, that witch came to kill Krishna. I mean, how can you be more demoniac than that? She put poison on the breast, took the form of beautiful mother, 
comes in. Oh, oh, what a baby. Oh, so cute. And then put on the breast. And haha, <laughs> my little darling. <laughs> so, and Krishna, he took that poison, but it didn't affect him. Krishna also took the milk. He took that as an offering. He said, oh, she wants to be my mother. And, but for the poison, he killed her. So he killed her, and then afterwards, Putana was getting the position of a mother of Krishna. A nurse, actually, a datri, one of the assistants of Mother Yasoda. So you can see Putana, she got so much, she got to Golok, and we try to get there also. Yet it is said that Krishna, uh, for one, when Lord Brahma saw Krishna, he was seeing how these residents of Vrindavan, uh, they're worshipping that Krishna. And, okay, he's a special boy. He lifted a hill, which is kind of impressive. But think of who am I? I am Brahma. I am putting planets in their place. He is lifting a hill, and I'm putting planets. You see the difference? Huh? You're seeing so, they give so much respect to him, but, and that's nice, but they should understand who they should really respect. Respect me, Brahma. So let me show them. And he stole the calves and cowherd boys from Krishna. Krishna took the place of these boys and, cow, uh, and, and, cow, uh, and calves. So then Brahma was shocked. Huh? And it said that Brahma lives on a different time. So... One moment of Brahma is the same as a whole year for us. So for a whole year, Krishna took the place of all those boys. And for a whole year, Krishna took the place of all those calves. And those calves, they drank milk from the cows. And the cows, they gave that milk with so much love to these calves, to the Krishna calf. And all the parents had Krishna as their son and they loved him so much. So Prabhupada says, Putana, even Putana was given the position of a mother. Can you imagine what position these cows are given? Who served Krishna with love? They get a much better position than Putana. And these mothers that treated their sons, now Krishna, for one year, they get a better position than Putana. So the demons get liberation. Usually the demons get liberation from birth and death, but they don't get Golok. Putana got a special benediction for Golok. Otherwise, only devotees get Golok. And the demons, they get liberation in Brahman. We don't want liberation in Brahman. We want Golok. We want eternally with Krishna. That the demons are not getting usually. Uh, that only devotees will get. So. So they go to Brahma Loka instead of going to Brahma. Brahma Loka or Brahman, it is the Brahma Jyoti. They go to the Brahma Jyoti. So they get the position as a Brahman again? Or? They are in the Brahma Jyoti and they stay there for some time and eventually, Patantyanadriti Yusmadangrahaya. Eventually they fall down from this. They cannot stay in the Brahma Jyoti. So w at one point after millions of years, they come back to the material world. And then they have to start again. But they will not be demons anymore. Okay, the Japa, the Japa group has arrived carrying lots of malas. They look serious. <laughs> they start to hand them out. <laughs> I, I, I already got initiated. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> so the chanting of Hare Krishna is a uh, is a good thing, and our Japa group is very enthusiastic, and uh, 
they will guide us through the chanting of the holy name. I'm going to give him the microphone because he... Ah, you look really nice like this. Oh, nice head. Very nice. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> 